you've probably used one of these things to boost your immune system at one time. Here we have, let's see, vitamin C capsules, omega-3 pills, antibiotics, and over here, hand sanitizer. We use these things because we understand the workings of the immune system, unlike our ancestors who didn't. I mean, how could they know? It certainly wasn't intuitive. If you think about breaking a bone 200 years ago, well, you could see the bone was broken. But if you thought of the idea that a molecule smaller than the cellular level was sending a transmission across the body to stimulate a fever, that was not going to register based on the technology we had. And as a result, the study of the immune system was effectively a backwater for a long time. But could it be that we're still in a relative backwater? The immune system continues to surprise us. For one, we're learning that our cells work in concert with many other tiny actors, microbes, suggesting that our immune system is like precision choreography. Yet we treat it like a combat zone. Are we harming ourselves? I'm Seth Shostak. I'm Molly Bentley. This is Big Picture Science, produced at the SETI Institute. And in this episode, how ecosystems rely on their tiniest biological participants. What are the consequences of our search-and-destroy approach to them before fully understanding the role they play in ecological and personal health? It's granting immunity. We're not saying that there haven't been incredible strides in understanding the internal biological mechanisms that help us ward off disease. For example, our growing sophistication using immunotherapy to fight cancer takes advantage of a strategy to combat that disease from within by using drugs that teach the immune system how to help itself. Immunotherapy is kind of a new generation of drug aimed at tinkering with the immune system, either to accelerate its efforts or to put the brakes on it. It builds on the idea that the immune system itself has evolved with the tools for both brute force and exquisite restraint and highlights our new appreciation about the role of balance in a healthy immune system, says New York Times reporter Matt Richtel. He won a Pulitzer Prize for his coverage of distracted driving, which perhaps explains his use of the words accelerate and brakes in describing the immune system. His book, An Elegant Defense, The Extraordinary New Science of the Immune System, points to another new discovery about it. It doesn't act alone. The way to think about the immune system is first to think about the world it operates in, and the world it operates in is one covered in microbes. So the desks we're sitting at, the microphones we're speaking into, our skin, we are covered with microbes, bacteria, virus, parasite, and our guts are populated by these things. Why is it so important to know this when you think what the immune system is? Because the immune system is not, it is not a war machine trying to destroy every alien organism in our midst. Were it to do that, scorched earth, nuclear winter, we are piles of white blood cells on the floor and end of story. So instead of that, what is the immune system? The immune system, in order to preserve us, but preserve us in the world we live in, is what I think of metaphorically as the combination of a bouncer and a ballet dancer. It has a very tough side capable of extreme violence when we confront a noxious infection, but it tiptoes very lightly like a ballet dancer so as not to do damage to microbes we cooperate with inside our bodies and outside and so as not to harm our own tissue you know, immediately makes me think of the immune system and cancer. Yes. Because, you know, you, you would think there's nothing that you would want your immune system to attack more quickly than, than cancerous cells, and yet it seems to be in ballet dancer mode there. Why, why is that? So just to define our terms, a cancer is a mutation of cells. It happens all the time. An effective cancer, a malignant cancer, is one that begins to grow inside of us. And one of the reasons that it grows, remarkably enough, and this is very new learning for us, 
is that it has sent messages to the immune system that says, put on your ballet dancer shoes, withdraw, leave me alone. I am not something you want to attack. I mentioned that the immune system is intended to have tremendous balance. And so many of the molecules in the system, this diffuse network in your body that you asked about, are molecules that put the brakes on the system. In fact, arguably, and we don't know enough yet, but we think that maybe as much as half of the systems of the molecules involved in the immune system are intended to dull it, dim it, turn down the volume to keep it in balance. A successful cancer is one whose malignancies include, whose mutations include the capacity to turn on the brakes. So it's a kind of a defense by, if you will, uh, subduing the enemy's troops. Subduing the enemy's troops. So you've described how cancer has escaped an immune system defense, and yet immunology seems to be the golden-haired boy these days Yeah, of fighting cancer. Now, how is that going to work? So what we have learned how to do is send a message, in effect, to those molecules on the immune system that have been stymied by cancer and say, no, that actually is a foe. That is not self. Go forth and conquer. So we are tinkering at the molecular level with this extraordinary system such that we can turn up the volume, turn down the volume, bring the hammer, bring the brakes. That's how these systems work. All right. So the essence of this idea is to somehow manipulate the immune system, the the white blood cells or whatever part of the immune system you're talking about, to recognize cancer cells as indeed enemy cells and let them go at it. I mean, that's, that's the idea, okay? All right, well, that sounds like, you know, really good news. But I think we should also talk about the fine print here because I mentioned multiple times that there's this balance to be struck between the bouncer and the ballet dancer, between the accelerator and the brake. And the trouble with unleashing the immune system, if you will, or removing its brakes is that it's not quite so discerning as to say, I will only go after the tumor. And what you can wind up with are side effects as dangerous as the cancer itself. I'm not saying you will get those side effects, but I am saying that we should hold two truths right now that are conflicting. One is hope, hope, hope. This is a major step. And the other is buyer beware. You've got to understand the risks. We ain't there yet. What about uh, boosting my immune system? Because if I go on the web, yeah. Yeah, I can find lots of uh, things I can buy to supposedly boost my immune system, including just advice like eat your veggies or exercise, yeah. whatever. Does this really work? I mean, does this really boost my immune system? And do I, given what you've said about the immune system and being sort of a mixed bag of, of, of capabilities there, maybe I don't want to boost my immune system. Maybe, maybe I just want to leave it the way it is. You do not want to boost your immune system. And it's one of the biggest misconceptions that I have had righted. It is an understandable marketing message that is flat wrong. You don't want to take a well-balanced immune system and edge it up. Because what you could do, frankly, is more harm than an outside pathogen or microbe might do to you. But there is a big distinction between boosting and supporting. And supporting Mm. your immune system is incredibly valuable. You can support your immune system such that it makes better decisions. It is calibrated more finely and more effectively, and it is there when you need it and you can support it, that's different than boosting it. Well, finally, Matt, what about training it? Yes. I mean, what, what about taking your kid and saying, go play in the mud and in the dirt and so forth, and yeah, I don't mind if you lick the floors. I mean, that might be good for you, right? Yeah, so what you're getting at is another changing conception of the immune system, which had been called the hygiene hypothesis and is now called the old friends mechanism because these microbes are not all our foes. There's a good argument to be made that we have over-sanitized our environment. 
all those microbes that we talked about earlier surrounding the desk, the microphone, the steering wheel that your listener may be holding right now, those microbes wind up informing and training the immune system. The bouncer and ballet dancer are trying to calibrate properly what to react to, when to throw the haymaker punch, when to tiptoe away, when to use toxins, when to surveil and not attack. In order to do that, like any system, they need inputs. They need testing grounds. They need boot camp. But I want to hit on one area that is so promising and so embryonic, and it's the microbiome and the therapies that may come from understanding how our gut works. A word on the microbiome. The microbiome is this body of bacteria that lives inside you, that shares your corpus, much of it in your gut. We don't understand much about it, but what we've begun to understand is this thing is integral to our survival. And Seth, why wouldn't it be? Because we are its planet. It needs us to survive. What we are discovering is that this mosh pit of bacteria, all these molecules are communicating in and outside the lining of our gut that keeps it there, and even instructing and informing the immune system, and even instructing and informing our brain function up to neurodegeneration. It could well be that our capacity to harness what is naturally inside of us just like vaccines and distinctive from antibiotics. Antibiotics in their own way are a chemotherapy. They are something from the outside. But like vaccines, microbiome work and other immunotherapy may begin to use our internal mechanisms. And that could be as powerful and more powerful than any external medicine that's ever come about. Our hope, our salvation lies not in our stars, but in our bodies. Yes. Matt Richtel, thanks so very much for speaking with us. Thank you, Seth. Matt Richtel is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist with The New York Times, and he is the author of An Elegant Defense, The Extraordinary New Science of the Immune System. I mean, it's clear that trying to train the immune system is a very elegant approach to fighting disease, right? I mean, we, we think of fighting disease with, with pharmaceuticals, which are, you know, external chemicals you bring in, and they have some toxic effect on whatever is ailing you. But this idea that you've got that built-in <laughs> defense system, why not retrain those troops to fight the enemy rather than bringing in some fresh troops that really don't know the territory? And that there are all these other players working with the immune system that are part of the immune system, that's a better way of putting it, which are the microbes that make up the microbiome and the the T cells work with these creatures to keep your whole body in balance in the best scenario. Just as we've adjusted to the idea that we are made up of and dependent on microbes and viruses, like a juggler adding another ball, along comes a new participant in the microbiome. We could talk about the bacterial microbiome, or we could talk about the fungal microbiome. And the fungal microbiome has led to the the cute word mycobiome. Myco as in fungi, as in mushroom. Yes, there's a fungus among us, and it may even be in us, along with bacteria. Find out how diversity boosts your microbiome's effectiveness. Next, it's Granting Immunity on Big Picture Science. We're talking about your immune system on Big Picture Science and the ongoing research regarding the role of your microbiome in keeping it robust. Good health seems to rely on bug balance, battling the bad bugs while leaving your beneficial bug buddies alone. But as biologist Rob Dunn says, there's more to the story. Microbes also depend on each other. In other words, like in many communities, strength comes from diversity. The professor of applied ecology at North Carolina State University shares a couple of studies of why that is. The thinking here is that our immune systems evolved in the context of a regular exposure to many kinds of microbes. 
And so as our immune systems learn about their environment and are exposed to it and respond to it, it was kind of a foregone conclusion that they would always have these sort of normal exposures for many of these different lineages, each producing their own products. And that in the last couple of hundred years, we've isolated ourselves so much from the outdoor environment that that diversity has been disconnected from our immune systems. And so they're starting to overreact in a whole bunch of very complex ways that lead to allergy and asthma or Crohn's disease, inflammatory bowel disease, MS, the list goes on. Now, that all sounded very vague, and it's partially vague because although it's becoming very clear that there is a negative consequence of not having exposure to certain kinds of microbial diversity, and very clear that those consequences are becoming much more common, exactly what's going on mechanistically has been pretty hard to figure out. Well, let's look at one study that, um, actually a couple studies, but let's begin with one study that'll illustrate why uh, the greater the diversity of beneficial or harmless microbes, the lower possibility that you may get sick. And, and there was a study done with E. coli, and it found that, well, maybe you can say what scientists found. There was a beautiful Dutch study recently that looked at if you took microbes of differing numbers of species, you imagine that you're making a microbial world, and then you inoculate into that microbial world pathogens like E. coli. What the study found was that if there were just one or two species of microbes in that microbial world, and you can imagine it's mimicking our guts or our skin or a child's body, that the E. coli could persist for quite a long time. But as they added more kinds of microbes, that the E. coli could persist less and less time. And when they included a microbial community that was sort of as diverse as you might find in nature, the E. coli basically just disappeared. And so part of what's happening here is that most of the pathogens that affect us are actually not that good at competitors. And so the more diverse microbes we have on our gut, in our skin, in our surrounding environment, the greater the odds that at least one of those species is a really good competitor that can knock out these pathogens that we don't want. The flip side of this is that in a hospital, what we tend to do is to try to disfavor all diversity, and then something like E. coli shows up, and it's got no competition. And so it can just go about its business in a sort of a competition-free environment. It's, it's the only shop producing its things in town. So is it that a pathogen like E. coli is kept at bay because there are other microbes there taking up space and resources, so it has to do with resource scarcity, or does it have to do that you happen to have a beneficial microbe on you that produces an antibiotic that then wipes out the um, E. coli? Depending on the condition, it's a mix of those things. And so on, on the skin, it seems to often relate just to taking up physical space. And so a pathogen arrives in your hands. If you have a nice layer of good microbes on your hands, that pathogen encounters that layer of microbes immediately, and it's hard for it to find any place to sort of set up shop. At the same time, especially closely related microbes tend to produce antibiotics that kill each other. And so some of the microbes on your skin and your gut are actually producing antimicrobials that are directly warding off the thing that might affect you. And I think it's probably a surprise to lots of people to learn that, you know, when a pathogen lands on you, you shake some stranger's hand at the airport and suddenly you've got a rare pathogenic bacteria species from somewhere else in the world you never encountered before, what first encounters that pathogen is not your immune system, but instead the layer of beneficial microbes on your hand. And most of the time, it's probably that layer that kills the arriving pathogen before your immune system even knows it's there. Oh, that's incredible. Um, one of the startling things that you have revealed is that we've actually known for a long time that microbial diversity is beneficial and we've lost that knowledge. Now, you describe a long-term study in the late 1950s, I believe, in which, to test this theory, newborn babies were deliberately exposed to a beneficial strain of Staphylococcus. Is that right? Now, this is a study that we, we couldn't do again, but we did do it back then. And, and can you briefly explain that study? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's sort of a mind-blowing study. So. So basically, there was a strain of Staphylococcus that was moving through hospitals that was a pathogen, and it was infecting newborn babies, and it was a big problem, and it had started to spread at the scale of the U.S. And there wasn't a good solution as to what could be done about it. And so most of the work focused on how do you prevent it from colonizing a nursery in the first place. 
So a couple of doctors in New York noticed something unusual, though, about this pathogen. And what they noticed was that if you looked at brand newborn babies, they were very susceptible to this pathogen. And so if you looked in a nursery of 24-hour old babies in which the pathogen had started to spread, most of them would be colonized. But if you looked at babies that were in a different nursery with no pathogen in the first 24 hours of their life and then moved to a nursery with the pathogen, they didn't seem to be colonized. So what this group thought was that maybe other bacteria were establishing on those babies that were in the healthy nursery first and preventing the pathogen from colonizing. And so what they proceeded to do was to find on a nurse a species of what they thought was a beneficial staphylococcus and start to intentionally inoculate babies, newborns, with that species so as to ward off the pathogen. So to be clear, there are two strains of Staphylococcus. One is a beneficial strain, and then one is the one that's pathogenic. And and they were trying to inoculate the babies with the beneficial strain. Yeah, and this was totally bold. There was very little precedent. I mean, a little bit of verbal precedent, not much experimental precedent. And they just, they thought it would work. And so they did some preliminary experiments and relatively quickly found that it did seem to work. And then other hospitals started to call this team and say, hey, could you come to our hospital and inoculate all the newborns? And so across the U.S., newborns started to be inoculated with this beneficial staphylococcus. And so some of your listeners were inoculated. And it worked, and it rid hospitals of the pathogen. Although I introduced the word inoculate, uh, the babies weren't given a vaccine. They were just exposed to these bacteria. Garden might be the better word. The seed, in this case, some bacterial cells of these microbial populations was just sort of swabbed into the nose or onto the belly button of these newborn babies. And and these are bacteria that the babies would have eventually become exposed to. What was key here is the timing, that they were exposed to it right after they were born. Yeah, the, the idea was that they needed to be exposed to this beneficial strain first before the pathogen found them. And that beneficial strain needed to grow into the nose and in the belly button so that when the pathogen showed up, that beneficial strain would keep it at bay. So what these scientists had discovered was a naturally evolved way of fighting disease bacteria. But then the study was stopped, and we lost that knowledge. And now, of course, in in many hospitals, you do have dangerous strains of viruses and, and bacteria taking hold. And when I was reading the study, I thought, Rob, how have we gone so wrong? How did we lose this knowledge? We did. We sort of lost, there's a lost generation that happened in there. And partially what happened is that in a medical context, antibiotics, which were already available, but not successful in treating this strain, which was resistant to penicillin, but newer, cheaper antibiotics came on the market. And that was a really, really easy way to treat the pathogen. And so hospitals switched. And so once they switched, it seemed like a wonder cure, and it was cheap. And that's sort of a recipe for not looking back. You know, the solution's cheap. It seems to always work. And you know there's going to be a problem in the future, but today's a really busy day. And so that's what happened in hospitals. And I think on the research side, we're easily trapped by the same sort of phenomena because the funding moves, you know. So antibiotics are working. We need to discover more new antibiotics. And so we shifted away from these kinds of ideas. And I think the other thing is that growing something seems old-timey. It seems like, uh, oh, well, that's um, you know an unsophisticated thing when we could use chemicals to kill something. And so we really set up medicine as this model where, like, we kill bad things and we prevent them from harming us. And there's not much of a history in, in modern Western medicine for we grow good things. And so even in the beginning, I think that this work of gardening uh, was up against sort of cultural barriers that were always going to make it difficult. Rob Dunn, thank you so much for speaking with us. Oh, my great pleasure, Molly. Thank you. Rob Dunn is a professor of applied ecology at North Carolina State University and is the author of Never Home Alone, From Microbes to Millipedes, Camel Crickets and Honeybees, The Natural History of Where We Live. Okay, I've often been told that I'm somewhat of a fun guy, but this guy has a lot more experience with fungi than I. I'm David Underhill. I'm a professor of immunology at Cedars-Sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. Now that we've become acquainted with the millions, 
that's really an underestimate, the billions, the trillions of bacteria living on us and in us and that make up our microbiome. Scientists have identified another member of the club and have given it its own ohm moniker, mycobiome. Myco being the Greek prefix for fungus or mushroom. The term mycobiome has come to refer to the fungal component of the microbiome. Studying the fungal microbiome requires a DNA sequencer to identify who's who. Dr. Underhill studies malassezia, which you may know as the fungus that causes dandruff, but which he also knows as an inhabitant of some people's guts. I, I know that's hard to digest. But they're not only there, you have to think of the fungal microbiome in the same way that you think of the bacterial microbiome. Anywhere you would find bacteria, you are likely to find fungi as well. And so studies have absolutely found malassezia on the skin, in the nose, in the mouth, in the stomach, in the intestines. Okay, we are trying to get a grip on this idea, Dr. Underhill. We have a fungus on our tongus and in our digestive tract, but that's not the same as a stomach full of mushrooms. You're absolutely right. We're not looking at mushrooms growing in the gut. Fungi include a much broader number of organisms. Here we're talking about yeasts and molds, yeasts like baker's yeast that you find in your bread and your beer, and molds like you would find growing in the dirt. We find representatives of both those kinds of organisms growing in the gut. All right, so how big are these things? I mean, I think of fungi as being a lot bigger than bacteria, for example. Sure. Your basic fungal cell is on the order of, of 10 to 100 times as big as your general bacterial cell. So 10 to 100 times the size of a bacterium. Now, I know I can't see bacteria with my eyes unless I have a microscope in front of those eyes. But 10 to 100 times, maybe 100 times the size of a bacterium, maybe I would see that as a you know, little point or something. So a single fungal cell you'll still not see with your eyes. It's still smaller than a human cell. These fungi are down in there with the bacteria. You know, are they teaming up with the bacteria uh, either to help combat a disease or to cause a disease, or are they just doing their own thing, you know, just trying to reproduce and take over as much of the gut as they can? There's a deep literature on fungal and bacterial interactions in ecology. So, you know, on the forest soil and plant roots and things like this, uh, characterizing, you know, both mutually beneficial and combative interactions between fungi and bacteria. In fact, most of our antibiotics, things like penicillin, come from fungi, right? So fungi make these things specifically to, to fight with bacteria, which leads to the really interesting idea of, as to whether fungi are interacting with or fighting with or helping the bacteria in the gut. And the answer to that is we just really don't know yet. I understand you're studying malassezia, uh, the fungus that also causes dandruff, somewhat of a surprise to me. I didn't know that dandruff was caused by, I don't know, a fungus. I always thought it was something uh, having to do with, I don't know, hair hygiene or something like that. What does your research suggest about its presence in our guts as well? This study started with an attempt to understand whether the fungi that we find in the gut changes in people who have diseases of the gut. In this case, we looked at the microbiome, the microbes that were associated directly with the intestinal walls in people with Crohn's disease. Using DNA sequencing to identify all the fungi we could find there, we found that malassezia was specifically enriched or more present in patients who had Crohn's disease than in healthy people. You know, Crohn's disease is a chronic inflammatory disease of the gut. It affects you know, something on the order of 1 in 200 Americans. We don't know what causes it, and we don't know how to cure it. All right, so what you wanted to find out was whether the fungi were just sort of sitting around, not playing any part in this disease, just sort of passive onlookers, or whether they were somehow involved in either fighting the disease or promoting the disease? Right, so that's a very tricky question. A lot of microbiome studies are focused on looking at how the microbiome changes in disease. What you're getting at there is whether that change influences disease, is a cause of disease or makes disease worse or better. And that's actually a much harder question. What we've done with that is gone into animal models of that disease and ask, well, would malassezia make disease better or worse in an animal with intestinal inflammation? 
and find that indeed it, it makes disease worse, which leads us to hypothesize or believe that perhaps the, the presence of malassezia in these patients might be exacerbating the disease. All right, so these uh, fungi are not uh, not helping and they may be hurting. Maybe you could tell me, David, how you know something that's normally associated with my scalp could get into my gut. I mean, <laughs> what did I do? I don't eat dandruff. I mean, but, but how did it get down in there? So that's a fantastic question and one to which I just don't have an answer yet. This is a normal organism you find on your skin, whether you have dandruff or not, even on healthy skin, you'll be colonized with malassezia. We actually don't know terribly much about why in the context of dandruff it becomes something bad or uncomfortable. I'm kind of curious. I mean, if you're you're studying these things in our guts, maybe I mean, you, you still haven't figured out, you know, how to treat Crohn's disease because it's not exclusively caused by these fungi. But what about fungicides? You know, why can't I use them in my hair? <laughs> you absolutely do use them in your hair. If you have a particularly bad dandruff and use some of these medicated shampoos, they have antifungals in them. And you are actually treating the fungi on the scalp. My goodness. But uh, what fraction of them might be involved in disease? I mean, we were talking about malassezia, but uh, I think I read somewhere that uh, they might be implicated in, in neurological diseases such as Parkinson's. Do we know about uh, any other bad actors down there that are fungi? Yeah, I, I think the real answer to that is we just don't know enough yet. The field is so new that we're only now beginning to sort out what the fungi might specifically be doing that would be similar to or different than the bacteria that are present. I expect that fungi will turn out to be a critical piece of the microbiome in how it influences uh, health and disease. You know, we've certainly grown and developed uh, with, with fungi in our gut just as an evolutionary thing, and it seems most likely that they have beneficial effects as well as the obviously manifested bad effects that are associated with diseases that fungi might cause. Well, finally, David, it is a bit of a surprise to me that I have fungi in my gut as well as bacteria. I mean, what else is down there that we don't know about? Am I going to find mammals in my gut? I mean, you know, there seems to be no end. Dude. We, we have as much nature in us as outside of us. I mean, we have evolved to be the humans we are in an environment that's full of living things. And if we had to be entirely sterile, to survive, one imagines we wouldn't have gotten that far. We certainly wouldn't have gotten as big as we've gotten. So we have incorporated the microbes around us into and onto our bodies. You know, our immune systems know how to live with them in a healthy and beneficial way. We have bacteria on us and in us, as we've been discussing. We have fungi on us and in us. We carry a lot of viruses on us and in us that are part of us. In fact, we carry viruses that are specific to those bacteria and those fungi on us and in us. We could go farther, you know, we carry other single-celled organisms on us that we don't know a whole lot about yet. We carry worms on us and in us sometimes, and our immune systems know how to work with that. Uh, so I think there's a great depth to explore there with our understanding of this wild ecology and how our bodies, in, in a healthy way, know how to live with it. David Underhill, thank you so very much for speaking with us. You're very welcome. David Underhill is a professor of immunology at Cedars-Sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. I like the summary that you gave there at the end, Seth, which is a good place to put a summary, that there is as much wild us in us as there is outside of us. Yeah, well, you know, it's a little bit strange to think about it at first, that there are all these sort of foreigners <laughs> inhabiting your body, but in fact, they're not bad guys, most of them. They're, they're actually good guys, so I, I guess we ought to put out the welcome mat if I could somehow fit one into my digestive tract. And they're not even foreigners. These microbes have evolved with us since the beginning of time. Coming up, there are small players that also play a big role in the ecology beyond our bodies, and they're disappearing. There's no way that we humans would survive if all the insects suddenly would be gone. We definitely need them. Uh, they don't need us. What's causing the great insect disappearance, and why some say it could lead to ecosystem collapse? Next, 
It's Granting Immunity on Big Picture Science. If you've driven highways and country roads for decades, you undoubtedly remember when a long day behind the wheel would leave your windshield and the grill splattered with bugs. I bet you find that doesn't happen much anymore. In fact, so many people have noticed this weird absence of bugs on their car, it actually has a name, the windshield phenomenon. A Danish scientist recently recorded his experience. And he had actually measured the number of insects 20 years ago that hit his windshield when he was driving and now he drove the exact same distances again and counted and there was a huge drop. There were clues that insect populations are declining but it took a while to put the pieces of the puzzle together. Scientists have found that in many parts of the world the number of birds that feed on insects is dropping. Now the bird people knew this but the insect people only kind of knew it. Another clue The pollination of some crops and wild plants seems to be declining. But that trend wasn't connected to the disappearance of insects. But now we're pulling these disturbing trends together. Rob Dunn and others talked earlier about the importance of the diversity of microbes that help make up the wild ecosystem inside us. But as a conservation ecologist, Dr. Dunn says we have an equal indebtedness and dependency on the wild ecosystem around us. And I think we need to recognize that we're part of nature, and I think we also need to recognize that what we know about nature is still pretty humble. And so that means it's far easier to conserve nature than it is to break nature, break these sort of connections among species and try to rebuild them. And so I think we're in a key moment where we need to conserve many kinds of nature in our daily lives if we want to have healthy lives and a healthy planet. And insects, some of the smallest members of the ecosystem that we encounter every day, provide many of those interconnections. My name is Anne Sverdrup Thagesen, and I'm a professor in conservation biology at the Norwegian University of Life Sciences. And I study insects because I think they are the most fascinating organisms we have on this planet, and they are so important for us. They actually save our lives a little every day. We've been talking in this episode about the role microbes play in our immune system. We've heard the undesirable effects on our health caused by compulsively over-sterilizing our hands and our homes. Could it be that if we step back and consider the big picture, we'll find that insects play a similar role in the health of global ecosystems and that we've too often wrongly considered them pests rather than allies? Dr. Sverdrup Thigason is the author of Buzz, Sting, Bite, why we need insects. Insects are really the cogs in nature that makes everything turn, that makes everything work. And of course, yes, they're small, but they're so incredibly numerous and they come in so many different types and varieties. And yes, they are really incredibly important for the health of the ecosystems, the health of nature. Can you give us an idea of some of the roles that they play if we had to give them titles Pollinator is one of them, but what are the others? Yeah, pollinators, that's the one everybody knows about. But I think they are also janitors, and that's a really important role. Um, They tidy up in nature, take away all sorts of dead plants, dead trees, dead animals, and the dung that animals produce while they are living. And that's really important. They turn that back into fertile soil so that new life can actually grow from that soil again. And also they are extremely important as just food for other larger creatures. There are so many of the, like birds or freshwater fish that are dependent on insects to eat. Do you have a favorite? It's always so hard to answer. Um, I think maybe the tiny, tiny, uh, one of the smallest insects that we know, the fairy wasp, which is actually in, in Latin, named after Tinkerbell, the fairy in Peter Pan. And I think that is cute. The insect itself is also cute. It's incredibly small. It is so small that it can actually sit on the end of a hair from your head and sit there comfortably. And I think that is fascinating that you have insects spanning from that size all the way up to big stick insects, the length of your arm. 
So I think maybe the fairy wasp would be, that's one of my favorites at least. Before we talk more about what is happening to them and also some of the other uh, magnificent things that they're able to do, I wonder first, for fun, to give us an idea of how many insects are out there. And I think you say that it comes to something like 20 million insects for every human being. I wonder 200 if I, millions, actually. 200 million. Yes. <laughs> for each human? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wonder if I could give you an insect challenge. And just for fun, um, are you willing to name as many insects as you can, just to remind us what's out there? in 30 seconds. <laughs> that's a that's much bigger challenge in English, of course, because I, I don't know all the common names in English, but we can give it a go. Okay. If you need to th slip into Norwegian, uh, that's okay, too. Okay. <laughs> Name some insects. Okay. You have butterflies, you have beetles, you have all sorts of wasps, cockroaches, grasshoppers. You have the true bugs, and those are sort of the bigger groups. Then, of course, you have all the detailed species names within those groups, like fruit flies, bumblebees, burrowing beetles, the monarch butterfly, the fairy wasp, the dragonflies and their relatives, the damselflies. You have moths. Yeah, <laughs> we could <laughs> go on for a long time, I think. It's a lovely collection of insects, and of course, it's only a small grouping of all the insects that are among us. And something is happening to global insect populations. And I wonder if you could give us an overview of what is happening to them. Yeah, first of all, uh, I guess we need to say that we're not really sure about what's happening with the global insect populations because nobody has really cared to look. But what has happened the last couple of years only is that we have had several studies from different places in the world, from very different ecosystems. These studies have taken place in different places. Um, one, for instance, is from Germany, from the agricultural landscapes in Germany, showing a decline of 75% in 30 years in flying insects. And that is a lot. And then last year, there was another study from Puerto Rico and in, in the Caribbean from forest, a protected forest area, showing even larger declines in insect biomass in more or less the same time span. If these trends are global, or even if the global trend is anything partly like it, that is really scary. Let's see if we have this right. So one study suggested that as many as 75% of flying insects have disappeared, or at least they had in this in this locale. Uh, another study suggests it may be more than that. Yes, depending on, on how they trapped the insects, it was all the way down to 98% less biomass in Puerto Rico uh, in this forest in something like 40 years. It was a bit different in the time span as well. I mean, it, it does make sense that in many places of the world, at least where we have changed a lot of the natural vegetation, changed it into you know, monocultures, large fields with just one species instead of mixed natural vegetation. It's logical to think that we have taken away a lot of habitat for insects. And then it's not so surprising that they are not there. Where, where would they live then? If you just have a huge wheat field and you use pesticides there as well, very few insects would be able to live there compared to a lot like a prairie landscape with lots of different small niches for insects to live. Is climate change also playing a role in the vanishing insect populations? Probably. Uh, the Puerto Rican study sort of comes out as saying that climate change is probably the main reason for that drop. While in Germany, they're not really sure, but they ha think it has more to do with intensive use of intensive land use and pesticides in agriculture. But, you know, climate change is definitely influencing insects. It comes sort of on top of this effect of destroying their habitats. So Anne, you, you cited a, a couple studies that suggest that the insect populations are vanishing, and yet you also said, we don't know what's happening. We don't really know. What did you mean by that? It sounds like we do know. We do know from certain places, um, but these are mostly concentrated in some parts of the world, a lot from Europe, uh, some from North America and a few other places. But like we have very little data from Australia or from Asia. So the complete picture is probably that yes, insects are declining, but the exact speed of it and the magnitude, we don't really know. 
So let's have you introduce us to some more insects and talk about uh, what life is like for them and the sorts of things that they do. And you write that insects have been around for hundreds of millions of years. They live in all different kinds of environments from the hot springs of Yellowstone to the ears and nostrils of other creatures. And which nostrils are home, whose nostrils, I should say, (laughs) are home to insects and what kind of insects? Walruses, for instance, they have certain sort of parasitic insects living in their nostrils. And you also have insects living in the the pooch, I guess, of pelicans. Pouch, yes. Uh, Yes. uh, And there are lice living in the fur of seals that actually can, you know, go with the seals when they dive into the ocean. uh, Because otherwise the oceans are the only places where you don't find insects. But in a way, you do find them there still in the nostrils of walruses and in the fur of seals, for instance. Deep diving lice. Yes. <laughs> so uh, it is really fascinating, I think, how they have adapted to all these different places of habitats and all these incredibly bizarre and strange ways of living. It looks as though the insect populations are declining and they may be declining quite rapidly. And you must tire of having to make the argument for why we need insects. They have a right to exist on their own. But sometimes we do need to make that case. And I wonder if you'd like to say anything more about that, about why insects are so important to our ecosystems around the world. Uh, Yeah, I mean, the thing is that there's no way that we humans would survive if all the insects suddenly would be gone. We definitely need them. Uh, They don't need us. While if all insects were gone, we would see a ripple effect that we don't know the consequences of. We would see some sort of collapse of ecosystems. What we're seeing now is that the populations are declining. And we don't really know how this will play out, but we are starting to see consequences, like the fact that some of the food crops are not pollinated as well as they used to be. We are starting to see this specific connections between plants that are dependent on one pollinator and they are not synced in time anymore. So the one thing that we can be sure of is that if this goes on for some time, it will be harder and um, more difficult to be a human on this planet. And for this moral issue, I mean, we are lucky to be situated on this, the only spot in the entire universe with life as far as we know it. And I think we have a responsibility to sort of step down a bit on our extreme dominance on this planet and make room also for these other creatures that we share the planet with to live their small, strange lives together with us on on this planet. Anne Sverdrup Thigerson, thank you so much for speaking with us today about the things that buzz, sting, and bite about insects. Thank you for having me. Anne Sverdrup Thigerson is a professor of conservation biology at the Norwegian University of Life Sciences and is the author of Buzz, Sting, Bite, Why We Need Insects. All right. Well, what we're hearing in the show is we're all interdependent. We're living on each other and in each other. You have fungi and and bacteria that are living in our noses and you have insects living in the noses of, of walruses and we all need each other. And you can't just choose the tiniest organisms and, and wipe them out because they seem to be inconvenient. After listening to whom we spoke to today, I feel like a living zoo. All these critters, let's face it, the planet actually belongs to the small. Well, we can't think of a healthier group to work with than senior producer Gary Niederhoff, assistant producer Sarah Derwin, and operations manager Barbara Vance. I am executive producer Molly Bentley. Thanks also to financial support from Rena Shulsky David and Sammy David and to the William K. Bose Jr. Foundation. Big Picture Science is produced at the SETI Institute, a nonprofit education and research organization whose scientists study the origin and nature of life, including the formation of uh, planets. I'm the Institute's senior astronomer, Seth Chostak, and I'm pretty gutsy. 
Also, big thanks to our listeners. Your ears have been attuned to an episode of Big Picture Science called Granting Immunity. If you'd like to hear more Big Picture Science, well, you'll find past episodes in our archive, bigpicturescience.org. And our website also has links to the guests you heard. You may be listening to us on the radio, but did you know we're also a podcast? Subscribe to the Bi Pi Sci podcast and you'll never miss an episode. You'll find links on our website to the platforms that carry us.